Goedemiddag, welkom allemaal. Um, we gaan uh, zo direct luisteren naar het uh, verhaal van uh, Roland. Jullie hebben allemaal vast zijn uh, motor al zien staan boven uh, en de foto's al gezien. Hij gaat er uh, zo direct een, een mooi verhaal bij vertellen. Um, Ondertussen mogen jullie uh, van de tafel hier uh, staan een of, van, uh, een of ander aan drankjes. Mogen jullie alles pakken. Um, we gaan uh, niet rond, dus dat is ook een beetje uh, te krap voor en dan een beetje te druk. Dus jullie mogen alles pakken. En uh, ik zou zeggen, geniet van het verhaal. En, uh, mocht jullie vragen hebben, ik denk dat het handig is om die tot uh, het, het einde te bewaren, zodat we die uh, aan het einde kunnen, kunnen stellen. Ik zou zeggen, ga je gang. Ja, dankjewel. Woe! Ja, dankjewel. Leuk dat jullie allemaal zijn gekomen. Um, er zijn wat mensen die geen Nederlands uh, spreken. Dus even iemand iets op tegen als ik het in het Engels doe. Oké, okay, so, um, welkom. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about my trip to Cape Town. Um, it's going to be um, basically a couple of stories uh, guided by some videos and some photos, some of the photography I've made. Um, uh, but I'm going to start off with a little bit of um, backstory. Because. Um, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, super. Yeah. Okay, so um, I um, the the idea I had with people doing this is that they you know got kicked onto a bike when they were six and then uh, kept on riding motorbikes and kept on riding motorbikes and um, so before I started I had to feel that I had to do that which I did. Uh, I got my motorcycle license about five years ago. Um, and I bought this thing and turned it into that thing. Um, and I took that through Italy. Uh, and then that kind of sparked my interest in uh, riding motorcycles and doing trips. Um, the year after, um, uh, I went to South Africa and I rented a bike there. Um, and uh, a couple of weeks after that, I went to Norway on a different bike. Um, that was the year I first started doing off-road riding, um, which I hadn't done before in, in any, any form, no motocross or anything like that. Um, so I had to learn how to do that, uh, and I did with that guy over there. Um, so we went to Italy to a uh, Ducati riding experience, uh, and they teach you how to control big bikes off-road and uh, do all those things. And from there I went to Morocco and did some more off-road riding. Um, and basically that's where I stood. Uh, so I had around 15 days of riding off-road experience uh, before starting the trip. Um, so I get this question a lot, like, oh, when you're going through Africa, there's a lot of bad roads there. Were you like afraid of, of crashing and things? And everything went okay, and I think the preparation was, was fine. So, and a short thing about the preparation of the trip. Um, because the trip doesn't start the moment you drive away. The trip starts maybe half a year in advance. So you start telling people like, hey, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to start at this date. And then you know, you need uh, a motorcycle, um, and you need um, um, a second passport, which I, I, I completely, I found out completely by incident. Because if you go through Israel and through Sudan, they are conflicting countries, and if there are stamps from the one, in your passport, then you can't get into the other. Um, so gradually, I found out all these things, and I went to the municipality in Amsterdam a couple of times to try and get my second passport and get all my injection and get everything sorted. Um, so then I bought a bike. I did a lot of work on it. Um, it started out as the same bike Jonathan has, um, which is outside. Um, and then when you go through Africa, there's um, well, there, there are a couple of things that you want to 
want your bike to be prepared for. First thing is that the roads are not very good. Um, so you want a bike that's very capable off-road. So the bike's on better suspension, it's a little bit higher up. Um, there's also not that much fuel uh, sometimes. There are stretches of six, seven hundred kilometers without any fuel stops if you go through deserts. Um, so the bike has three tanks, uh, one in the back and two in the front. Uh, and you don't really want your bike to break down, uh, so it has two fuel pumps. So if one of the fuel pumps breaks, I can still have fuel pumps in the back and <coughs> reroute all the fuel and everything. So it's, it's a quite clever bit of kit. Um, then I wanted to document my trip. Um, and um, I was thinking about how I wanted to do that. A lot of people would take these GoPros. Um, my background is uh, in uh, 3D visualization and animation. And I was thinking about maybe uh, taking some really nice photographs, I can print them really big. Um, and that's kind of where um, Leica comes in. Um, and um, that's where my search for a camera started. So what I wanted was a, a full frame camera. Um, so I could, could have the resolution I needed to make big prints. Um, I wanted to have uh, a, a fixed lens because uh, I didn't want to take lenses with me. I wanted to have one package and also if you're in the middle of the desert and there's sand and changing lenses and stuff, that's just not what you want. Uh, you want one closed thing. Um, and I like the idea of having one lens because it would challenge me slightly uh, uh, creatively in that um, if I wanted to make a portrait, uh, then I had to get up closer. And if I wanted to be with wildlife, then I had to be closer. Um, and in my search, the only camera I found that, that, uh, that fit that bill um, was the Leica Q. Um, and so I bought one here, and then uh, afterwards, uh, me and, and the guys here at the store started talking about doing this. Um, and uh, that's super nice. So thanks again. Um, it's super cool. Um, so then let's get into it. Um, it's the day that you drive off, fully loaded, fully packed, fully fueled up. And uh, my journey really started for me in Italy. Um, I've been to Germany a lot, I've been to France a lot, I've been to Switzerland for a bit. Um, and it was February, so it was really cold. And I wanted to get out into some warmer areas as quickly as possible. Um, so once I got to uh, Italy, I slowed down a little bit. Um, I took the bike and rode over a road called Lerovica, which is uh, a famous cycle race, or a track for a famous cycle race, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, mostly off-road. Um, and it gave me a chance to kind of get used to the bike because I bought it and then I didn't really ride it because I instantly stripped it down to convert it to this. And then, I mean, like, so the day before I left, I was at the suspension shop trying to get my suspension sorted out and have some new stuff fitted. So it was all quite close. Um, so I hadn't really ridden the bike off-road, so I wanted to know how it felt. Um, so then I go further down into uh, uh, Italy. I just keep on uh, going. And um, then after a little while, it is uh, time to get to the ferry. Um, and the ferry, the travel now is a bit interesting because the, the road that I took, I think you can't even take it anymore now. Um, and that's because of uh, two issues, um, Syria and Libya. So normally, the, in the olden days, you'd get a ferry from Spain to Morocco or from uh, uh, France to Tunisia and then ride through Libya to get into Egypt and then go down. Uh, or you drive through Turkey and through Syria and then go um, uh, into Israel and, um, and Egypt. Unfortunately, now, because Syria and Libya are completely off, off game, you can't go there, um, I'd had to take a ferry ride. Um, and um, I booked a thing with this rusty old thing, um, which was, wasn't particularly what I, I wanted to see when I rocked up with my bike. But, um, yeah, they, they took me there, and the travel it was supposed to go to Cyprus, uh, from Italy in Salerno to Cyprus, and then to Ashton in Israel. Um, and it was supposed to take four days. Um, and at the end of the first day, I saw that we were passing Sicily on the right. And my brain was like, well, if we 
if we don't make this in four days, uh, they better hurry up because, uh, you know. Um, so I wake up the next morning and uh, I, I have my breakfast, go up to the deck, and I check out my GPS tracker to see where we are. And I see we're not heading to Cyprus, but we're, we're heading left to Greece. So I'm like, okay. Uh, that's that's interesting. So I talked to the, the guys at the uh, at the boat, like, hey, what's going on? I thought we were going to Cyprus. They're like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to Greece and then Turkey and then after that we go straight to uh, Israel. Mm. So like, okay, and uh, how long? It's like, yeah, uh, maybe ten days. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm stuck on the boat uh, for, for 10 days and uh, I mean there was food and stuff but you know, you, you get, it gets very, very boring. Um, so um, then after those 10 days, um, this, this boat, no boat rocks up, this guy comes off and we, we, we see the shores of, um, of Israel. And um, then there's, there, there's many things that I didn't expect before this trip to, to be a real pain, and some things that I thought was a re were a real pain were super easy. But one of the things that were a real pain was uh, dealing with customs. Um, so at some point in time, did my, my motorcycle had to come off the ship and be imported into Israel. So um, once we got um, the, the boat docked into the harbor, there were three people coming on the, on the boat, and I still thought, like, ah, it's, it's like 3, 4 o'clock. Um, so these people already come on, they sign my passport, they sign my uh, Carnet de Passage, which is like a passport for your motorbike, and I'm off. Um, but no, the three people came on board. One was a lady from immigration. Um, the other two were also from immigration, but they, I don't know exactly what they, well, I found out a little bit later. So they started collecting all the passports. Um, and then they took all the passports and they took them back to uh, one place to stamp them all and then we would get them in the morning. The two other guys in the room, one of them had this beige suit and really fast sunglasses like one of the mercenaries from the war movies and a big gun mm -hmm. and he was like in the corner and, and he was kind of looking at me and he didn't say anything. The other guy was firing questions at me. Uh, and completely random. So he's like, so you want to go to Israel? Like, yeah. well, do you have girlfriends? Like, yeah. Yeah. What kind of work do you do? Why are you by yourself? Do you, do you have friends? And it was the weirdest conversation I've ever had in my entire life. And I figured, well, what's, what's going on? And then these people go away and then have to spend another night on the boat. So the following morning, I figured, okay, well, now it can't take long. So I, I gear up put all my gear on and I'm, I'm dressed to, to, to ride the bike off-road. So I have, I have motorcycle boots, I have knee protectors and I have a big crash vest. And So I'm fully geared up. I walk over to the customs uh, uh, office and uh, there was the lady from the day before. She, she was really nice and she helped me. She, she called uh, like, hey, what's the deal with this guy? He needs to get his motorcycle off the, uh, onto the mainland. Um, and she called and they said, well, you, you just have to go to this place. Like, it's a 20 minute walk, you get this piece of paper and then you can take it. Okay, so I go outside and she follows me. Um, and uh, I look at her and she's like, well, yeah. They tell me it's 20 minutes, it's not 20 minutes. So I'm, I'm gonna take you. So over the course of that day, um, we spent about nine hours uh, doing eight security checkpoints. Uh, with me fully motorcycle gear up, so taking off the gear, you know, and then coming back in, it's like, hey, it's me again. It's like, no, 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 you have to take everything off again. Um, so eight times, um, and, and in the afternoon, we um, we went to see the the, the 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 person who was, I think, the most crucial part. She had to stamp some paperwork, and we kind of figured out, the two of us, that because my boat, my, my motorcycle was on the boat. It was technically not in Israel, and it wasn't in a customs depot, so it couldn't be imported. So I'm like, okay, this is gonna take even longer. I'm gonna be here for a few days. Um, and then she does the ama most amazing thing. She fakes the paperwork. So <laughs> my bike is officially in Israel. Um, so then I, I go to the last point, like fast forward three hours. They, they took away my key from the motorcycle, by the way. So they, they thought that they had the key and the, the bike was in the customs depot. So I come to this lady at like at six o'clock 
And uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm just here. I paid everything. I just want the stamp and uh, I fetch my motorbike. So he's like, fetch your motorbike. Customs Depot is already closed. You can't fetch your motorbike. But she didn't know that I knew that my bike was still on the boat. So um, I said, like, ah, oh, but I, I, I'll just go grab some stuff from the boat because you know they're gonna leave, and then I'll be I'll be right back. So I go back and I take the spare key of my motorbike because I'm not an idiot, <laughs> uh, and ride it to the customs depot. And I come in, and she's like, oh, I got the bike, and the look on her face, completely surprised at how, how I managed to get my bike from the closed customs depot. Um, so finally, nine hours later, and a lot of hassle, um, I, uh, I I made it into. Israel, and I was allowed to cross the little border into the country. Um, so in Israel, um, because of the whole conflict, um, I had two passports, uh, but I only had one passport for my motorcycle. And at some point, I had to go into Egypt. Uh, and if you were very, um, would very scrutinously look at the paperwork, you could see that I would cross a land border into Egypt. And the only conclusion you could draw of that is that I was in Israel before. So if the Sudanese at the border were to look at this and, and find out that I've been in Israel, um, I wouldn't be allowed into Sudan. Uh, so I decided to at least give the impression of me going really fast through Israel. So I could tell them, listen, I really I had to do this. I was only there for one day. Uh, so in one dash, I, I wrote, um, unfortunately, because there's a lot of really nice opera and the people are super nice in Israel. I wrote all the way to Eilat, um, which is right on the border to, uh, to Egypt. Um, and then, so you have to imagine this, is the, I arrive, and that's a, that's a nine hour day of hassling. I do one day of driving, mm -hmm. and then I get my first border crossing into Egypt. Um, and the first thing that happened when I rocked up in the morning, I was like, hey, I, I, I want to go to Egypt. Um, and the lady said, well, you know, they don't really like bikers over there, so you won't get in. Mm. What? <laughs> <laughs> can, well, can I try? And she's like, well, yeah, you can try, but if you go out here and they don't allow you in, if you want to come back, it will take a few hours at least. So I'm like, come on, what, what's this? So I'm mentally preparing myself for another full day of hassle. Um, so I cross it, uh, into Egypt, um, I have to take all the luggage off the bike, go to x-ray machines, um, then I get a visa and everything, is going, everything goes alright. And then I get taken into a customs office and basically the stack of money that I had started disappearing in five or six different little offices. And in one I get a piece of paper, all in Arab so I can't read it, and another one and another one and then I get a license plate. Or well, two, one to mount to the bike, and the other one, and it was, was very important, and I kept it with me, so I could give it, uh, give it away, give it back to them on the other side. So that took about like five hours, and was kind of insane. So the first three days in Africa were kind of, uh, um, yeah, relaxing. What's that? Relaxing. <laughs> relaxing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so then, my original plan was to to go to Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, take a ferry into Hargada, uh, and then from Hargada go to Luxor and go down to uh, to Sudan. Unfortunately, when I got to Hargada, the, the people there said, "Yeah, well, this is not really like your country. You can't just go on a ferry. Uh, you will have these, these tourist things, and you go on the tourist thing." I'm like, "Well, I'm on my motorbike. I just want to come on motorbike. Come on the tourist thing." And they're like, "No." <laughs> so I couldn't cross the ferry. So I had to deviate to Cairo. Um, which in the end was uh, quite a blessing because um, I met this guy at the Sudanese embassy. Um, so I, tr I decided to get my visas along the way. So that meant that for Sudan and for Ethiopia and for Kenya, I had to get visas at the respective uh, embassies in the countries before them. And while I was there, I heard this um, this, this guy, Rob, uh, in a very posh British accent, so like, oh no, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm driving down to Cape Town in my big truck. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So I, I got to meet, I talked to this guy. So uh, I talked to him and uh, we were roughly taking the same route. So we decided to team up for a bit. 
Um, this truck only goes like 80 kilometers an hour, it's really slow, and it's, uh, but his company was really nice. Um, and um, it turned out to be even better because the moment we drove into Luxor, um, I kind of hit some trouble. Um, the check engine warning light was on on the motorcycle um, and uh, it only went 80 kilometers an hour. So here I am with my 20 grand motorcycle that's four months old and I can't ride it anymore. So I have to go into this lorry for 13 hours back to Cairo next to a guy that doesn't speak a word of English to go back to the KTM dealer to get it sorted. So then I got it sorted, I rode back and about halfway between the border of, uh, to Sudan and Luxor, it happened again. Um, and this time around, there's no time for me to go back to Cape Town, wait for parts, and go back to the border because my visa is expiring. So the next option, because the bike still rides, but at like 20% power and it only goes 80 kilometers an hour, um, the next option to get it fixed is Nairobi, which is 4,000 kilometers away. Um, so I was really cranky, uh, but I, I, I decided to push onwards. Um, and this is where uh, it was really nice to have Rob in a big truck, because you can see that I don't have any luggage on my bike. We took all of it off and chucked it in the truck. So I had very little wind resistance, and now I could just be completely pinned at 80 and just you know, live my horrible life. Um, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I built the bike to do certain things and to be very capable off-road, so that like once when this stuff happens, it's, it's, it's a pain, you know? especially for 4,000, that's it's over 10% of the trip. You know? um, so from there on, we crossed the border into Sudan over Lake Nasser, um, which is it's very surreal. Um, the lake is, is um, it's man-made, so they flooded it, um, and there were some temples that they actually moved uh, higher up to, to accommodate for this. I think it's the biggest man-made lake in, uh, in the world. Um, and it's, it's very strange because there's no really, there's no beaches and things like that. They're just rocks that point out because they, they flooded all the beaches pretty much. Um, and um, yeah, then we go into Sudan. And um, this is one of the many times that I thought to myself, okay, now, now we're in Africa, right? We've seen camels and uh, yeah, you know. I'm still like the road is over here because I can't go off road because my bike's still ruined, but I mean, we, we're getting enough. Um, in there, um, I, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, because of time, I kind of skip over some little sections, um, but we, we rode basically in one stretch straight to uh, Khartoum, uh, which is the capital of Sudan. And um, it wasn't very... Um, nice in Sudan at that point in time, politically seeing, uh, because you had Omar al-Bashir, uh, which uh, the, the military were trying hard to protect, but the people really wanted him out. Uh, so there were some demonstrations. And once we got through a place called Dongola, we stayed at this hotel with all shattered windows from riots, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't feeling very safe. Um, but then when we got to Khartoum, I met up with a guy who uh, is a German photographer, uh, Raymond, uh, and he took me to this, uh, this ritual that happens weekly um, just in the north of Khartoum. Uh, that uh, <coughs> Basically, it's a, it's a Muslim ritual. This is at a burial site. Um, in this um, building, there's a lot of imams that have been buried there. And once a week, they come there with everybody, and they do dancing, and they have these chants, and they, they honor them. That's, at least if that's what I understood from it. Um, and it's quite interesting um, because Raymond had a wife from Sudan, uh, so he knew everybody there. And we were allowed to go into this big circle, but because we knew Raymond, we could go into the circle and get quite close. Um, and that's one of the things that, that you need if you have I mean, like a, a wide angle lens. I have to get up close to, because these aren't cropped, I have to be this close to the guy to take some photographs. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it makes it slightly more intimate to, to, to take the photos. 
Um, so then we continue uh, into Ethiopia um, and um, where Egypt and Sudan are quite barren, uh, Ethiopia changes because it's a lot more wet and you can see trees again. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot more of a beautiful country to ride through and see. Um, so then I'm still with Rob here because I'm, I'm, well, I can't go faster than Rob in his big truck, so I can't leave him behind even if I wanted to. Um, uh, uh, but uh, I decided, okay, I mean, I, I'm kind of used to this, this 80 kilometer an hour thing, at least let's take some gravel roads. So Rob took the, the asphalt road, I took the gravel road, and uh, it's about, it was about a 300 kilometer day. Um, and at the end of the day, I crossed into a town called Bahida. Um, and then um, another stroke of, of bad luck. Um, I'm in the right lane going 50, just cruising, and there's a guy there, and he decides to take an exit uh, and I smash into the side of his car. Um, so I come off the bike, um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I think I missed a few seconds here or there, but the last thing, or the next thing that I remember is basically. A lot of people around, I don't know where the crowds come in Africa, but they, they're instantly there. Uh, so there are about 40 people. There's a couple of guys saying I should go to a hospital. Uh, and the only thing I can think about is I, I need to stay in control of the situation. I don't want to be taken anywhere. I want to be with myself. Uh, so I text Rob, listen, I, I'm here. I, I had a crash. Uh, I popped some painkillers. Uh, my doctor supplied me with some good stuff before I went, so uh, that really helped. And luckily, the only thing that happened was my uh, my bicep was uh, twice as big because there was a lot of uh, fluids inside of it because I smashed his mirror with it. Um, in the end, it was all kind of okay. Uh, the bike was okay. Um, I had to fix, uh, mend some things here and there, but uh, everything was okay. So after two days of resting. Um, we decided to, to head onwards, um, which was interesting because if you go over bumps and this is a big fluid blob, it will s slap your inside and it will it hurts like crap. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, so we survived and then uh, uh, we got to uh, Kenya uh, and uh, more specifically Nairobi, um, where I could fix the bike. Um, it was KTM dealership. I had some people who sent uh, uh, some sent a part that was broken to Nairobi, so I could come and fetch it. And um, this is a, anybody read the book uh, Out of Africa from Karen Blixen? Yeah. Uh, so these are the Ngong Hills, <coughs> and just on the on the floor of it, basically, or on, on the floor, well, well, just at the base of the mountain, basically, there was Karen Blixen's house and, uh, overlooking the hills. It's uh, it's quite a stunning uh, view uh, you have over Nairobi. Um, so from there, uh, the luck kind of changed. Um, there's a guy uh, called uh, Lyndon Poskett, um, and he's, uh, uh, he's been doing this for about five years. He, he rode around the world on his bike for five years. He did three Dakars and all these sort of races. Um, and it was a really cool guy, and I heard he, he had broken his hand. Uh, he was recovering, and he was flying back into Nairobi. And I was thinking, okay, that might be cool to meet up with him and ride with him. You know, I'm having done Dakar, and uh, as you can see, we have quite similar bikes, and, and uh, I figured it would be quite cool. The problem was, my, my part was supposed to be arriving on Thursday, and uh, he was supposed to ride on a Wednesday. So I'm like, okay, well, we have this bad, leaks, bad luck streak going, so this, this might as well be added to it. But then on Saturday, I get a, me a message like, hey, listen, um, your package is at the airport. Come pick it up. So I go to the airport, and uh, unfortunately I couldn't bring it because the customs were closed, and, and generally it's it's a big hassle. But there was one guy who was really friendly, and he, we were talking about my trip, and he's like, okay, you know, I, I understand it's, it's just a replacement part. Blah, blah, blah. Come back on Monday, and we'll sort it out. So I come back on Monday, I walk in, and there's a really really big, incredibly cr cranky black woman sitting at the receptionist. And she's like, what, what do you want? What do you want? Mm -hmm. I want you to just pick up a package. She's like, well, you have to fetch this piece of paper in town. And I'm, you know, I'm being fed up, completely fed up with this whole situation. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that. 
Uh, but I know where I have to be because I was there before and I was wanting to offer. So I, I walked past her. Uh, surprisingly, she didn't say anything. So it was okay, I guess. And then once I walk in, I see the guy. And he's like, hey, man. Let's go. So he, in the meanwhile, had been talking to the guy who was supposed to clear my package. Um, so the guy, I, I pointed him to the part of my motorcycle. We unpacked the package. My friend sent a big bag of candy with it. So I started giving out candy. Everybody was really happy. Uh, and uh, then the customs guy was like, with his mouth full, he was like, oh, well, it's a really tiny part. That's all right, man, just, just take it. So I, I didn't have to pay anything. Normally, there's like 100% import tax on, on motorcycle parts and everything. It's, it's nuts. Um, so because I had, to, uh, I had a pair of tires shipped into a bit later where I had to pay another time the tire, basically. Um, so yeah, I was really lucky then. Um, so I got the bike fixed. Uh, I did uh, a ton of maintenance on it. Uh, so new tires, new chains and sprockets and new everything. And then it was time to go on a test ride on the Anglong Hills. Because contrary to the Netherlands, if there's, you can just go everywhere in Africa. It doesn't matter. There's a hill, if there's, you know, there's a road, but then next to the road, there's this off-road thing and that's really cool. And you just go there. doesn't matter. They don't care. So we go on top of the hill, um, and uh, well, this work doesn't work as good as I expected it to be. That's what I'm unfortunate. But let's see. Well, we can skip this. It, it, eventually, I get to the, the hill where it starts getting steeper and steeper and steeper, and I'm like, oh, maybe this wasn't such a great idea uh, to 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 do this. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it gets really steep, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> kind of dismount. Um, but yeah, so um, the bike's working again. Um, I'm quite happy, but you know, I still haven't really ridden the bike that much, especially off road. And now I'm going to ride with this guy. This this is his bike, who's done three Dakars and all of his mates. <laughs> so. We, I, I'm a bit nervous for this, um, but Lyndon, uh, he sent me a message like, hey, listen, um, let's meet there at 10. I've got a place where you can stay, and, uh, um, um, and, and, and we're going to do some game drives and some other stuff. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I meet up with him and his mates, and for the reference, for the people who don't ride motorcycles, so me and his bike uh, have three tanks. We both can carry more than 30 liters of fuel. We have full luggage. And we weigh around 240 kilos, 250 kilos fully packed. The other bikes, about half. So we're, 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 we have to struggle a little bit on the big bikes. It's a lot heavier than, uh, than on the small bikes. So we ride out of Nairobi, and this guy, one of the guys on the, uh, on the, on the red bikes, he, he turns left into the off-road section, and, and he just opens up. And I'm behind him going, <laughs> I'm not sure if this is such a great idea. Um, after five minutes or so, I relax a little bit, and then I notice, hey, I actually, I, I kind of got this. This uh, is good. So, yeah, I'm hoping that this uh, works a little bit better, but I'm, I'm not sure it does. But basically, so, there's sections where you do like 120, 130, off-road, that's like uh, uh, faster than I've ever ridden in off-road. Um, and then, just for a fun little side fact, if you look at the Dakar guys now, they do like 175 of the same stuff. It's mental. Um, but yeah, so we rode this like full day, uh, it was like 200 kilometers or something, um, and it was great fun because on these roads they built these speed bumps, um, but they're, they're like, like this. and. If you go over them at 100, you 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 actually they're actually jumps, uh, and that's uh, that's that's great fun. Um, yeah. So did you take that with the queue? Uh, no, that's just a go. Yeah, just a go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we arrive, um, and then uh, we we go on these uh, game drives that Lyndon been talking about. And what he failed to mention was that he was invited to this crazy five-star lodge uh, and uh, we got like a, a little palace all to ourselves or well, I got a palace and he, and he got his own palace with like a separate room and a fireplace and, and once you came in for the night there was like a 
uh, like this, the, the bag with the warm water, so the, the bed is nice and warm and like super possible. And then we went on these game drives, and then um, the the his his people would, would set up a fire somewhere in the game park. So they, the, the the hotel had like a private game reserve, uh, and then there was a big cooler box of wine, and then and then on the way back to the to the lodge, we found out that the guy who's behind the driver behind the wheel was actually a rally driver. Um, and with a couple of glasses of wine, uh, <laughs> he thought it was a good idea to kind of show what it's like to do a rally. So we were looking back to the, to the lodge in the back, uh, back of a big Land Rover. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's African. You, know? it's, uh, you, you can do all those sort of things. It's, uh, it's great fun. So one of the guys that, um, that we rode with on the red bikes, um, called Hunter, he provided me with a bunch of off-road tracks to go from Kenya into Tanzania. Um, one of them is uh, uh, they went through this riverbed, and it's really nice because the riverbeds have little step-ups, and you can jump off of them. Um, but what he failed to mention is that one, once I got to the rocky bit, I shouldn't continue in the riverbed. I should go outside of the riverbed um, because it's quite it's a bit rough. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean. This doesn't look like much on video, but the, the drops here are like a, like a meter, basically. The, the, the rocks on the side are like this high. And I'm on a 250 kilo bike and I'm str struggling. This was really, really, really rough. Um, and then down here, there's just loose sand. Right? So you have to navigate through these rocks, but all through loose sand. And in the meanwhile, you're riding, you're smelling your clutch, your bike's overheating, and you're just overall like in stress going, oh, I just want to, get out of there and you know so it's a rough 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 stuff sometimes um, so lesson learned if you, you take some tips from people just ask them hey listen are there sketchy bits that I need to know about um, yeah but it did make for some really really nice views uh, and it got me into Tanzania where I hit the rainy season um, <laughs> so there's this one big streak in Africa and it kind of moves up and it's just insane amounts of rain. Um, I managed to skip it for the first bit, going to the coast in Tanzania. Um, but then once I got there, it was raining really hard. And the access road to that uh, lodge that I was staying uh, was 12 kilometers of pure mud. Um, so one of the guys from the lodge uh, was also a motorcycle rider. Um, we rode back out together. He decided to wear swim pants so he could just jump in the pool uh, and get clean again. Uh, I didn't have that luxury. Um, but the 12 kilometers to go out of the, uh, of the, of the lodge uh, took us the better part of two hours. Um, and you, your tires fill up with mud, so you're basically, your wheel is mud. And mud on mud doesn't give much friction, so you're just slipping everywhere. And, uh, yeah. Um, Further on in Tanzania, um, so would you uh, uh, get, at least in Tanzania and, uh, and later on in Malawi as well, they have these plateaus. Uh, so you drive off your main road and then you go up a bit of twisty road and then you're up really high and the landscape is completely different. Um, and the roads up there are, are extremely nice to ride on because you have all these big ruts and big rocks and, and it's very technical riding. And, um, I was getting more into the off-road stuff and it was really, really, really nice. Um, yeah. So then once you get up, um, basically I came from this place, and then once you go up, like in five minutes time, the landscape changes to this, mm -hmm. which is completely different. And then five minutes after that, it changes again. And I, I've seen this sort of landscape a couple of times, where it's like a billiard thing draped over the mountains. And I never really got it on camera really well. Um, in person, it just looks very surreal. Um, and yeah, it's, it, but it's, it's, it's great. And then once you get into Malawi, the same thing. I, I go up this plateau called the Nika Plateau. And then once you're up, it's, it's completely a, a, a completely new landscape, unlike if I've ever seen in my, in my life. Um, and then there's a lot of wildlife um, that's just cruising around there. Normally, on a motorcycle, you can't go into the national parks. Um, because lions chase motorcycles, and it's really dangerous. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm not actually not joking. Uh, and elephants do. Elephants have been known to get motorcycles, especially two strokes, because they don't like the sound. Um, but in here, you could just do it, and there were zebra and uh, uh, war thogs and, uh, and giraffe. And, um, I mean, this is taken with the like it's not cropped. So I, I, I've been, I got quite close. This was like 10, 15 meters, and I just killed my engine. I walked up to him, um, and you can see him that he's kind of scoping me out, like, do I run or don't I run? All of his mates were already gone. Um, but yeah, I, I, I quite like this, uh, this photo. It's nice. Um, so then I'm going to skip over a couple of countries um, because we've been at it uh, 16 minutes. That's actually not too bad. Um, so when I was practicing this yesterday, I was at like 45 minutes or so. Um, but I, I, I figured I'd skip over some sections and just do good stuff. So. I basically my trip uh, from uh, Malawi. I went into Zambia, uh, and then I went into Zim. My plan was originally not to go to Zim because there's no fuel and there's no food. Mm -hmm. uh, but I met a guy, and his family owned half of Zim, and had all these lodges. And they were like, "Yeah, come on, we'll have fuel and we'll have food." So I went through Zim in a couple of days, through Botswana, and Botswana. There's a picture here with an elephant on it. Um, that was in Botswana, and. Other than that, I mean, in the end, my trip was kind of about riding motorcycles. Um, so in Botswana, there wasn't that much off-road riding. I was really struggling to find good off-road rides where, where I was allowed to go, definitely. So um, I chose to go into uh, Namibia quite, quite quickly. Uh, at this time, because my bike was broken, I already had a delay of about a month. Um, so I also needed to get a little bit of speed. And, my bank account said, hurry up. Um, so in Namibia, I decided to, um, to follow the tracks from the Dakar guy, because he just did it the same thing, but up. Uh, and he said, well, you, you've got to do this and this and this and this. And one of the things was the Van Zels Pass, um, which is the, supposedly the hardest mo the pass in Namibia. Uh, cars aren't allowed to go up it, because it's too dangerous. Um, and just the road from here to the start of Fenzels takes seven hours on, uh, on a, four, a four by four. Um, so I decided to do that and the Fenzels pass and about another 250 kilometers in one day mm -hmm. because I thought that was a good plan. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I started off in the morning. I uh, drove uh, to the top of the Fenzels pass um, and from here on, there's a, there's a little video to, to show what the, what the riding is like. Um, from there, I uh, went through some more completely barren stuff. And that's the best thing about, I think, Namibia is that I drove this, this entire day uh, about 450, 500 kilometers, and I saw two people. Uh, and that's it. Uh, which was, uh, and, and some people go, okay, but that's really scary, isn't it? You know, you're all by yourself. But for, I, I loved it. It was, it was, it was really nice. Um, yeah, and then you know, you come across this stuff, and there's just no one for kilometers and kilometers around you. Um, just absolutely nothing. Um, and that's just really nice. So this was the road up to the Van Zels Pass. And you can kind of see these boulders are all this big, so it's um, it's a bit rough. Especially, I mean, people do this in four by fours. It's insane. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a bit of a rough track. So this is the actual Van Zels. You go down. Um, and these are like quite steep drops into big rocky sections. To the left, there's nothing. So if you go over to the left side, you fall off. Um, there were some, some uh, trailers and stuff from people who had attempted this, but then the trailer tipped and fell over. They couldn't get it out. Um, in the end, I, I, I didn't think it was that hard, to be honest. Maybe in a car, it's more, it's, it's, it's crazier, but um, there are basically like three really steep drops. So then we get to probably the craziest thing I've done on a motorcycle uh, ever. Um, another thing that this linen guy told me to do, uh, and 
I happily accepted the, the challenge, um, was to ride up uh, a thing called Dune 2. So in Namibia, near uh, Walvis Bay, you have this huge section of dunes. And Dune 7 is the highest dune in the world, and it's there. Right next to it, this one, is Dune 2. I don't know how they measure these things, because according to Wikipedia, it's 380 meters. My GPS had like 120 meters height difference. Um, still tall, because 120 meters is like a 40 story, 40 story building. Um, so, um, Lyndon said, okay, let's, uh, you, you gotta ride up this. So, here, you, you're not allowed to ride here, you are allowed to ride here. Uh, just for scale, so this is a big wall of sand, uh, which is around 200 meters, and this is the Dune 2. So, here is kind of the top, uh, which is, I, I'd say it's kind of the similar height. Um, so, Lin, Lyndon did this and had it on video, and then I decided it would be a good idea to try and attempt the same thing. Um, but once I got there, it was huge, like uh, uh, proper scary big. Um, so I decided to try it. So I, I did that wall of death thing. Um, so you have to ride up in at like 80 kilometers an hour to get up to the edge, um, and then do that whole loop uh, to go back down. Um, but that 80 kilometers an hour was not enough to get on top of the dune. Um, it was so incredibly steep and so incredibly high, and I didn't know what was on top of the dune. Maybe it just goes down, you know? So if you overshoot it, then <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're in a whole heap of trouble. So when I got there, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, and uh, you know, you see some more of my tracks here to the right, and then this is like the highest attempt, and then I'm still not there, so I built out. And so then I go back to the hotel and I think about this, and I'm like, no, we, we, we have to man up, <laughs> and we have to do this. Um, so the next day, uh, I go up, uh, and uh, this time around, I, I go a bit faster. I talk to Lyndon, like, hey, what's on top? And it was flat. So I go to the top, and uh, it was, uh, the view was amazing. But then once I got there, my camera died. <laughs> so the only thing I had was this one, which was made by my GoPro. And you can see the quality is complete shit. Um, so I posted this on uh, my Instagram, and, and I got a comment from Lyndon saying, hey, what happened to your luggage? Did you get stolen? <laughs> so he went up the thing with all of his luggage on the bike. Right? So I decided to be a bit cheeky and take all that off, all that weight. You know, I'll only fill my rear tank and, and just go up, uh, which saves about 50 kilos. Um, but then, you know, I, I, I had to do it again with lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Um, and now that I knew that I got it, I mean, these are tracks from the day before, so I kind of just rocked up. Uh, and uh, yeah, I decided to, to kind of just do it. And, uh, that was okay. So you can see this, the, the speed is kind of insane. I didn't realize this until I saw the video. But you go down, and there's about 110 kilometers you hit at the base of the, um, uh, of the dune to, to completely get up there. Um, and uh, yeah, I, once you get to the top, you're still doing about 50. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy how high it was. And uh, this was a, a pretty proper mission. And yeah, so this is June 7. So I, I'm not entirely sure about the heights, but I feel they're kind of equal, and that's definitely not 380 meters. So I don't know how do you measure these things. But luckily, I came prepared because this time I did charge my camera. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, which is... Uh, uh, Have you yeah. seen these crazy looking trees over there? Uh, sorry, which the, ones? The very strange forms, trees. Oh, the death ones. Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't think so. No, okay. I, I, uh, no. no I did, I, so my, my idea behind this trip is, is I, I really like riding motorbikes. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a very big fan of doing really touristy stuff. So if somebody says there's a nice tree and then there's a picture mm -hmm. on the internet, oh, yeah, it's fine, there's a tree and then... Yeah. Um, I'd rather go try and ride my bike up on a dune. <laughs> um, yeah, but so uh, these uh, proved to be uh, quite uh, quite cool. Um, 
And uh, go on then. You got this. Um, yeah, the only thing that I didn't take pictures of was was um, the way down. Because um, the first time I went down, it was, it was quite okay. The second time I went down, I went down on a different plot, and my bike was a lot heavier. And then I noticed there was this huge hole right there, and I was slowly slipping, like sliding towards that hole. Mm -hmm. And basically, in, in the dunes, you get these big pits. And if you if you come if you get into the pit, you can't get out because the sand is too loose, and you just bury yourself. So I'm there, and I'm like, shit. So I try and get to go over this this ridge on the left. So I get up there 90%, but then because the, 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 the sand is so thick, and if you close the throttle and you don't uh, give power anymore, you just dig in. So I'm like this much from the top. And then I need to turn around, you know, carry around the bike, and, and I must have been struggling for like an hour, taking off all my stuff, because it was really warm, taking off luggage to try and get off of the, uh, off of the dune. Eventually everything was all right. It was, uh, it, was, it was quite a mission. Um, but the, this is, I think, my favorite picture of the whole trip. Um, uh, so so it, was, it was worth it. <laughs> so then finally, we enter South Africa. Um, I decided to cross over a little bit to meet some people that I met, I met in, uh, uh, from Joburg, uh, Johannesburg. Um, and then I went into Lesotho. Um, and Lesotho is like this little country inside of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And Lesotho has a uh, ski slope. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't expect that. I, I came up on this mountain, and you can see here that there's this little track, which is a downhill mountain bike track. And a friend of mine got, told me, yeah, you can, can go right there. He didn't tell me about ski slope, he no, only told me about that. It's like, what? And it was busy, like it was all fake snow, obviously, but there was like a lot of people snowing and, or snowboarding. And, and it, was, yeah, it was a bit weird. Um, but other than that, the Sutu is absolutely stunning. Um, and the riding is arguably harder than it is in, uh, in Namibia. Um, some of the mountain passes up in, uh, up in the Sutu were just insane, like big, big rocks. Uh, and just like these sections where you have like 40 meters of just those big rocks that you have to get over. And you can't go over them too slow uh, because the bike is too heavy. So if you hit a rock and your wheel decides to go that way, you just fall down. So you have to kind of keep speed and just trust that everything's going to work out and just <laughs> um, And at that, at that point, I was really lucky that I had proper suspension and stuff on the motorcycle. Yeah, um, everything turned out to be uh, quite all right. But yeah, this is, whew. yeah. <laughs> and then she needed a little rest. Um, but yeah, that got me finally on the last stretch to Cape Town. Um, and uh, basically this is, this is the route uh, around 28,000 kilometers, um, off of which this bit was done at 80 kilometers an hour. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, so this was my talk. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. Right, any questions? No questions? How many tires? Uh, five rears, uh, three fronts. Wasn't too bad. I have seen basically two questions. One is, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit curious, so I would like to know a little bit of your know, journey, photographic journey prior to, to your trip. And the second, I couldn't avoid to notice mostly on the pictures, uh, uh, not all of them, but they're quite big amounts. Uh, I see the horizon very close to the middle. Okay. Yep. And is that uh, because of uh, you're mostly sitting on the bike, or or it's just a conscious composition decision? And why? Okay. Um, 
I, I have to say, first thing, I didn't pay much attention to the horizon, honestly. <laughs> um, but because the horizon is not the thing you're taking a photograph of. Right? I take a photograph of the mountain that's in front of the horizon, mm -hmm. or the bike that's in front of the horizon. And I think by uh, arranging a composition so that the thing in front of the horizon is more important than the horizon itself, you, you gravitate towards that, then you don't really uh, have to pay attention. And then sometimes there are these pictures of where there's nothing, and then I kind of like this half and half composition, just a line to the middle of the stuff. Uh, before this, I, I did some 3D visualizations and animations, uh, architectural stuff. Uh, so I, I do know a little bit about composition and the digital or the, the virtual cameras you use in the 3D visualization work in a similar way. They're kind of like this. So uh, I think that's my problem. What, uh, what's the next adventure? Is it the Dakar or something else? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the Dakar is a bit expensive. Uh, the Africa Eco. Uh, Africa Eco, yes. Yeah, but there are definitely some, I think there's some, going to be some rallies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at some point in my life, I'd like to do Af the Americas. Yeah. Where did you sleep mostly? Yeah. Did you have your tent or did you put the photos? Uh, I had a tent. Um, and I'd say I slept about half of the time in, in a oh. tent. Yeah. Um, I did spend a lot of time just in hotels and by complete luck in, in lodges that people invited me to um, uh, and then yeah if you get the chance to not sleep in the tent then yeah Sahara's Rally is on the list and uh, uh, I only do my work for uh, uh, the, so these newer bikes, they, um, for the Euro 4 emission laws, uh, they have to go to these tests. And what the manufacturers do is for, the tests basically go about city traffic and highway. In the city, you're mostly in first, second gear. So what they do is they put a sensor in your vehicle to, to see in what gear you're in, mm -hmm. and then adjust emissions according to that. So they'll inject less fuel, so you burn less CO2. Or you cost less CO2 in the air. So that sensor was broken. So the bike didn't know what gear it was anymore, so it didn't know how to adjust the fuel air mixture or fuel air mixture ratio. And I'm, well, due to I, I was not going to banter on KTM too much, but I'm a software developer. It was it, it would have been super easy for them to just go to the fifth gear setting with just an optimal fuel to air mixture ratio and the bike just working fine with the light. Instead, they chose to go into this limb line, which is idiotic. Uh, yeah. So you have told them that by Yes. Yeah. Um, that's, it's a whole, that's a, I can give a whole presentation about that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have to make any repairs on the way by yourself? Like broken tire or something? Yeah. I, I, so I ride with um, really, really thick inner tubes, like half a centimeter thick inner tubes. Um, and they basically they, they didn't break down. Well, I had two times in the front tire, so I had to fix that. Uh, but other than that, because it's it's 28,000 kilometers and I do a lot of off-road, there's a lot of maintenance involved. So uh, you have to loop your chain every day. Uh, you have to change oil every every 5,000 kilometers at most, probably earlier. Um, all the moving parts need to be greased every once in a while. Um, so there's in general quite a lot of maintenance uh, going on. Um, yeah, and, and I ended up fixing that part myself. Um, so before you said that the customs were a big problem, was there a problem through all the Africa or only at the beginning? Um, so the northern part of Africa is much worse than the south, oh. southern part. Uh, the moment you get from like Kenya down, everything is, okay. is easy. Um, Sudan, Ethiopia, and um, e Egypt are, are quite mm -hmm. Take the east because it was less dangerous. Then people also take the west. Yeah, two reasons. So one, Nigeria didn't really sound, and Boko Haram didn't really sound that nice to me. Uh, whereas Kenya and Botswana and, and Zambia and Zimbabwe, that all sounded really nice to me. 
Um, so I feel that the, the East Coast, and maybe I got a little bit inspired by the, the, the Long Way Down documentary and kind of wanted to do the similar route. And, um, but yeah, I, 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 even now I don't think the Eastern uh, or Western part of Africa is, um, I don't get enthused by that. How long, how long was the whole trip? Uh, five months. Uh, what, what was your food routine? What, what did you eat <laughs> mostly? Uh, just anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, my doctor gave me this broth bank of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, so when my stomach acted up, I just popped one, like three of them, and it was good. <laughs> Uh, it didn't happen that often, actually. It was uh, it was quite, it was quite okay. So you made just what was on the way. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the best thing there is just just eat street food, mm -hmm. see it being prepared in front of your eyes, because um, then at least if they undercook it, you can go no, just chuck it on the fire again. Mm -hmm. you know, really sure. yeah. Would you recommend this trip to anyone at all? There's a there's a lady doing this by herself now. Yeah. Um, this, she has a YouTube channel called On Her Bike. Um, and she's doing the whole trip by herself. Yeah, not not the, the hard off-road stuff. Um, the, the the minimum requirement to do this off-road stuff is that you can um, pick up your bike by yourself easily in whatever situation it's in. Um, if you can't do that, then I, I would not recommend doing this. If you just go on the roads, so, I mean you can just do Sarmac all the way to Africa. No, nothing. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, I, I, no. I, I have to take this. So I have a tank bag, and in the tank bag there's a camera. And if there's filters and stuff in there moving around, I do I just get lost. So I just generally, I um, for landscape, I choose quite high aperture, uh, wide aperture, no, small aperture, small, like 60 to 8. Um, uh, and I underexposed uh, uh, one stop. Uh, yeah, well, just one full stop. And then, generally speaking, it's very easy to get um, detail in the shadows back, uh, but it's very hard to get detail in the highlights back. So it's better to underexpose uh, than to overexpose. It's not, it's not like. Yeah. How, how many percent were on their throat? How many percent on asphalt throat? So not taking the 4,000 kilometers through, um, mm -hmm. through uh, the northern part, I think it's about 50-50, 60-40, 60% uh, off-road. Um, in kilometers? In kilometers. Yeah. In time, probably more. But I mean, at a certain point in time, you ride your bike every single day, and um, through like Namibia and uh, the lost sections, I was doing, was driving just as fast as I would on, uh, on regular roads, pretty much. Yeah. What, what was the biggest challenge overall? Was it the mental part? Was it physically? Was riding in really like heat can be quite challenging as well? So overall, what was the biggest challenge during the trip? I didn't know. The biggest challenge was uh, my own uh, head. Basically. Yeah, um, not not necessarily. I think it was all a breeze, apart from that 4,000 kilometers. That kind of tested my patience. I was in a country where, so so the northern part of Africa is, is isn't the most hospitable place. Hospitable, most most nice, friendly, open people. Everything like if you just watch a conversation between two people, after about 30 seconds, they're shouting, and it's completely normal. Uh, and for me, that was very uh, stressful. So um, combine that with the fact that my bike was broken and I couldn't do what I wanted, and I didn't really know, I, I didn't feel that I had support from, from KTM back home, and um, then, yeah, I got really cranky and I turned into not such a nice person. But, I mean, it worked, because they started shouting instantly. So if I just do the same thing, then it's like, oh, okay, he's, he's not a tourist, so we got to get some stuff done then. So it helped in the end. But, uh, yeah. what, what was the biggest lesson, like, lesson that you learned over this trip? Like the biggest thing you, you remember? Well, I think, so after I met Lyndon and I did, and we were riding quite fast. Um, where, where, sorry. What's that? Where, where is that? After I met the, the, oh, the Dakar okay. guy, uh, I think I, I, I saw some things in my brain uh, subconsciously as a race. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I mean, I, I had the time pressure on me to try and get to Cape Town before my funds depleted and before, I, you know. Um, 
but I would have taken it a little slower. Slower. Um, so the next time around, I would make the trip about something else. I wouldn't make it about motorcycling, but maybe strap a surfboard to the side of my motorbike. I make it about surfing, uh, right? And then it's no longer about racing, and you have a surfboard, so you can't really race. Um, but I think I flew, I mean, it was great, don't get me wrong, it was awesome to, to do the 450k through the desert, just thin, it's awesome, but when you do, I mean, you can drive your bike to Morocco and do the same thing. Um, you, you don't, you, Namibia is not a requirement for that. Um, so yeah, I'll take it a bit slower and longer. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? I think it's um, it's a good one to, to shut it down for now. Um, Ronald will be here to ask questions, so no problem. But I would say uh, grab a drink, uh, take a look at the photos again. They're on the screens, and um, for now I want to say thank you. Um, we had a small gift for you that were really nice stickers on the side of your motor, but yep. they're not there yet, yep. so uh, <laughs> yep. they will come and yep. uh, probably uh, be shown on our Instagram or something like that as well, so you can see that later on. Um, so I don't have anything here right now, but <laughs> that's Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So, drinks were here. Don't hesitate, I'm gonna grab something here also, because it's pretty hot down here. This